Hi, ladies. This is Dr. Melissa Rich, and welcome to another episode of the Taking Care of Your Temple podcast. This is episode 23, and we are doing Defeating Depression Part 2, because I recorded the first part last time, and there was just a lot of material, so I decided to divvy this up into two different parts. So let me give you the introduction that I always do. The objective of this podcast is to help women and other people. I know I have some male listeners as well, and that's totally fine. Aimed more toward women, though, to help them connect with God regularly, to use his grace, power, might, wisdom, strength, everything in order to improve their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And there are four principles that we use in order to accomplish this. The first one is to keep our focus on God. This sounds so basic. It can be so hard to do. (laughs) There are so many distractions. I mean, you get started on something and you get pulled in 20 different directions, or maybe that's just me, but it can be very difficult. And I have found this is a process. This is something that I have to do continuously. I have to keep pulling my attention back, pulling it back, pulling it back and keeping my focus on God. Second, acknowledging that we are not enough on our own. This is something that when I was younger, I really struggled with a lot more because I thought I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty capable. I can do all this stuff. Yeah, I've learned I'm not nearly as smart as I thought I was. I mean, I am pretty smart. God made me smart. I'm pretty capable. He did that too, but I still need his help. I can't do it all on my own. Or let me put it this way. I can't do it very well all on my own. So I've learned to just invite him into everything and to try and make sure before I start doing something that this is actually what he wants me to do. Third thing, third principle, remember it is about progress, not perfection. Thank goodness. If it were about perfection, we would all be in trouble. But really, God just wants us to keep learning and to keep moving forward. You know, when we screw up, and you will, acknowledge it, fix it, move on. One of the things I pray regularly going along with the first principle, keeping your focus on God, is that, Lord, when I get off track and I know it's going to happen, help me to realize it quickly and to get myself back where I need to be. I mean, that really is what I pray now because I'm not going to, I know that I am not going to be doing any of this perfectly. It is just not going to happen. Last thing, work on consistently changing our thoughts. Our thoughts are so important because they dictate how we think, how we feel, how we act. And, you know, if we have a lot of negative, toxic, beating myself up thoughts going on in the background, it's going to be so much harder to make any progress, to to move forward at all. So a lot of times we need to figure out what messages am I giving myself? And then if they're not helpful, and a lot of times they're not, go ahead and change them. Okay, so let me go ahead. Those are the four principles. Let me say a quick prayer here, and then we will get going. Lord, I just want to thank you that uh, you allowed me to do this podcast. I'm enjoying it so much, and I pray that other people are enjoying it as well, and that it is helpful. I ask that you will give me the words to say and to say them the way that you want me to. And I ask your blessing on the people who are listening right now. I pray that these words will help encourage them and support them and help them to make positive changes in their life. Thank you for your love, Lord. Amen. Okay, so today, as I said, we are doing part two of Defeating Depression. And I chose that title specifically, one, because I like the, um, I think it's called alliteration when things start with the same letter. Um, And I just like the idea that we can defeat depression. It doesn't have to defeat us. That's what it feels like a lot of times. But really, there are things that we can do. So some of this I talked about a little bit last time. I'm going to review some of it. But then a bunch of the material is new to this one. So most of us, thankfully, do not have a depressive disorder. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute. But we all feel depressed at times. We feel sad. We may be down about something. We're grieving for things. Sadness is a part of life, ladies. It it's just is. So we all deal with sadness at times. Now, clinical depression is also known as major depressive disorder. And this is a more long-term, ongoing thing. And it can last for years. 
Then there is situational depression, which is what it sounds like. It's over a particular situation. Usually this occurs in relation to a loss of some type. Situational depression tends to be short term. And it can develop after you experience a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events. Some triggers for situational depression can be um, relationship breakup. Again, I mentioned this last time, it doesn't matter who initiates it, whether you did or your significant other, it can still be depressing to not be in a relationship anymore. Getting fired from a job, having some type of accident that it's taking you a while to recover from. And we talked about perceived loss with expectations. One of the big ones that I see on this one is a divorce. People who, again, no matter who wanted the divorce, once the divorce is final, then they have all of these expectations that they know now are not going to be met. They had these dreams with this person and not going to happen. They're not going to go grow old with this person. They're not going to travel together and do, you know, all these expectations and dreams that they had are not going to be fulfilled. And people can grieve over those. Um, another one is a death. It can be pet or human. And I talked about losing uh, my little dog, Daisy, last time. I also, several years ago, had a 16-month period where we lost my mom. It was expected. She had cancer. My sister, very unexpectedly. And then my husband, also unexpectedly. So I was experiencing what is called compound losses, boom, 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 on top of each other. And what I noticed for me, I did not have a depressive disorder, and I'm very thankful for that, but I, I was experiencing situational depression. I would start out a week, be doing okay by about Wednesday. I felt like I was slogging through quicksand. I had no energy. I had my concentration and focus were shot. My memory was terrible. I would I would start doing something and lose track of where I was and have to start over. People would tell me things. I wouldn't remember them. I was definitely not all there. It did get better over time. I mean, and, and I'm fine now, but it was definitely situational depression due to several traumatic events. I mean, losing three people who I loved. It was hard. So depression, definition of it, is a mood disorder that can cause an ongoing feeling of sadness and just loss of interest in normal activities. It can affect how you feel, think, and act. It can also, this is interesting with depression, it can lead to a variety of emotional and or physical problems. Depression is a very common mental disorder globally, estimated about 5% of adults worldwide have had at least one depressive disorder. So this time I want to talk about prevalence in teens. Last time I talked about prevalence in adults in the U.S., I want to switch it over to teens because this is something that really, y'all, is becoming an epidemic, and it's, it's something we need to be aware of and take seriously. It is estimated that 4.1 million adolescents in the U.S. between ages 12 and 17 have had at least one major depressive disorder. And I said last time, if you've had one disorder, odds are higher that you're going to have another one. So when you have them starting really early in life, it is a lot more serious than if you don't have a depressive, uh, depressive episode until you're like in your 50s, because odds are then you probably won't have another one. But these kids who are having them, they are going to have more. It is a scary thing. The prevalence of major depressive episodes is higher in adolescent females, about 25.2% than adolescent males, about 9.2%. And I thought this was a sad statistic or sad piece of information. Depression is sometimes called the common cold of mental illness because it is so prevalent and so widespread. Major depression is the most common mental disorder in the U.S., and it is the strongest risk for suicide. So again, I'm going to go review briefly these types of depression because I did talk about them some last time. First one is major depressive disorder, and this, these, are, um, these are clinical 
types of clinical depression. These are ones that can be diagnosed. And this is where a in major depressive disorder, you've got this dark mood that is just ongoing. It kind of leaks out into everything. You lose interest in activities, even ones that you used to enjoy. It is severe enough to to interfere with daily functioning. That's one of the big keys for depression. And depression can also change a person's thought processes and affect their bodily functions. Again, it can be pervasive. Next is seasonal affective disorder or SAD. This is the one that happens frequently during winter months when the days are shorter and there's not much natural light. And I think I said, oh, it typically goes away in spring or summer. I said last time I could probably never move to Alaska because I've always suspected I have some of this. Since I've always lived in the South, it hasn't manifested, but the thought of like six months of darkness would drive me batty. Then there's bipolar. Most of y'all, or a lot of y'all may have heard it as manic depression growing up. And these are the people who have the really, really highs, and then they're scraping bottom down below, and they can just alternate up and down, back and forth between them. I always have thought bipolar sounds absolutely exhausting to just be going up and down like that. Um, Then there is persistent depressive disorder, which used to be known as dysthymia or dysthymic disorder. This is kind of a low grade, uh, low level depression that can just go on for a long time. These people, every now and then they may dip down into depressive disorder. Every now and then they may go up into feeling kind of normal but most of the time they live in this low-grade depression. And y'all, that just makes for the most joyless existence. These people are functioning okay, but they are not having a good time. They're not having fun. And I, if you know someone like that, I strongly suggest that you encourage them to get some help. There is help out there, and you don't want to live that way. Then um, I talked about the fact that there are two depressive disorders that are common to women. Of course, because we are so special, we get our own kind of depression. The first one is perinatal depression. This includes major and minor depressive episodes that happen during pregnancy or in the year after the baby is born. Perinatal depression affects uh, up to one in seven women who give birth, and it can just be devastating on the family. Y'all, this can this can really be very, very severe. Then there is PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And that is a more severe form of PMS. Ladies, if y'all have never had that, and I'm fortunate, I have not, but I've known people who have, who have very severe PMS symptoms. That's what PMDD is. So some symptoms of depression. Okay. Loss of interest in daily activities that you normally enjoy. Things that you used to, to like, have fun with, you just don't do. You don't play your guitar. You don't bake cupcakes for the neighborhood. You don't garden. You don't take your dog on walks. Even though these were things that you used to really like, they're just too much trouble now. So you've lost that interest. And there can be appetite or weight changes. You may eat more or less than usual. You may gain or lose weight during depression. And what they say is if there's a change of more than 5% of your body weight in a month, that's when it's significant. And they start looking at it. Sleep changes, either sleeping a lot, which is called hypersomnia, or not sleeping very much, which is insomnia. Either one of those can be uh, as a can happen as a result of depression. Then there is anger or irritability. I find more men tend to suffer this when they're depressed than women do, and this is where people are feeling agitated, restless, edgy, annoyed, or even violent. The tolerance tolerance level is low. Uh, They have a very short temper. Everything and everyone gets on their nerves. And we've all had those days, but this is kind of an ongoing thing. They have a very short fuse and they go from one to a hundred really quickly. Then there's loss of energy. This is the one that I talked about before. Just feeling tired, sluggish, drained, Your whole body can feel heavy. I said I felt like I was slogging through mud or quicksand. That was about it. It was really hard. And even small tasks can seem overwhelming or like they're just too much trouble. They're not worth it. Suicidal thoughts. A lot of people who are depressed, especially when it's gone on for a long time, they truly come to believe that their family and friends will be happier if they are not there anymore because they're just too much trouble. Y'all, that is a lie. 
That is Satan lying. Don't listen to it because that is not true. Losing someone to suicide can be devastating for family and friends. Don't do that. When I was doing counseling and I had clients who were depressed, I would say to them, especially if it was like a major depression, I would say, okay, so is it feeling like what you really want to do is sit in a dark room and stare at a wall? And almost every time they would say, yes, that is exactly what it feels like. That is all I want to do. And I would tell them, look, if I knew that, okay, you go sit in that dark room for six weeks and then you'll start feeling better, I would say, go for it. Go sit in the room, pull the blinds, just stare at the wall. But it doesn't work that way. Sitting, isolating yourself, pulling back from everybody, just sitting there doing nothing. It does not make you feel any better. In fact, it makes you feel worse. So really what you need to do is make yourself do some of these things. And you're not going to feel like it if you're depressed. That's one of the key things. If you go with your feelings when you're depressed, you're going to keep feeling depressed and maybe even more so. You have to say, even though I don't feel like doing this, I'm doing it anyway and do it. And I promise you will start feeling better. It's going to take a while and it may be small increments, but you will get there. And I'm going to get to what you can do here in just a minute. Okay. So what are some of the causes of depression? Again, we looked at some of this last week and what researchers have determined is they don't know. <laughs> Isn't that helpful? Um, depression is a complex issue and they really think what it is, is there are a lot of things that interact. It can be genetic. It can be, uh, you know, like from your family, it can be your brain is just not working right. There can be stressful life events. And usually what they, they think is it is a combination of those factors that leads to depression. It's usually not one single thing. One big single thing, that's usually more situational depression. And then you do tend to get over that in a while. Okay. So some common causes of depression or things that can increase depression are the following. Grief. When we lose someone, or again, it can be an, a pet that we loved, it's very common to feel grief. However, most people, if they're pretty mentally and emotionally healthy, are able to get through that after a while and move on. It's when you see someone who it's been three or four years later and they're still in the same place, that's that's uncommon grief. And they probably need some help dealing with that. Major events. What's really interesting is, is that even good, hoped for major events can lead to depression. And things like um, starting a new job, graduating, getting married, having a baby. And I'll give the example of a new job. Let's say that in your work, you had applied for this position that would be a significant increase in pay and responsibility. Boy, you were fired up. You were after this for months and you got it. Yay. Except now you didn't realize it, but you were having to work a heck of a lot more hours. You have very little free time. You are getting bombarded with emails and texts and phone calls. It is incredibly stressful. You didn't realize it was going to be this bad. And you are getting depressed. That is an example of something that you really wanted, how that can also be stressful. Then other types of personal problems. Um, some type of Sometimes people get kind of socially isolated because of maybe an illness or an event that's happened to them. And a good example of this is someone who has a loved one in prison. And I've talked to some of these people because my mom used to be really big into prison ministry. She did that for like 25 years. She was amazing. When someone has a loved one in prison, what I have heard is that it is very isolating because typically when they will share that with someone, a lot of times the response they get is, well, they got what they deserved, didn't they? Not helpful. It may be true, but it's not helpful because they still care about that person. Yes, they, they did some bad things, but they still love them. But they can't talk to anybody about it. So they can end up feeling very isolated and just kind of cut off. And that can lead to depression. Sometimes a serious ongoing illness can... Um, can ha can trigger depression or depression can be triggered by the medications that you're taking for the serious illness. Um, 
so it, it, things like diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, kidney disease, HIV, AIDS, lupus, multiple sclerosis, hyperthyroidism, all of these things are, are conditions or diseases that either cannot, well, I'm not going to say they can't be fixed. They can't be fixed usually to the point where you are free of them completely. Most of these are things that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. And it can be depressing. I've had clients in the past, uh, especially teenagers who find out that they have, I think it's called teenage diabetes or early onset. I don't, I, I don't remember the correct name, but that's depressing. They're going to have to deal with this for the rest of their life. They're going to have to monitor their sugar and poke needles in themselves and test it. And it's a lot. And a lot of them don't like it, which I understand. I wouldn't either. Chronic pain. Oh, and also on the serious illness, researchers also believe, and I thought this was interesting, that when people with chronic illnesses treat the depression, sometimes it can help the medical illness improve because it tends to be circular. You have the disease and you're treating that and you get depressed about it and then the symptoms get worse and you get more depressed. And so if you can break in there and and get the depression under control, a lot of times the disease can improve somewhat and then you feel better. So you can go in the in a different direction. Okay, chronic pain. Y'all, pain is no joke. And when it lingers for weeks or months, it's called chronic. And not only does it hurt, but it really can negatively impact your lifestyle. You have trouble sleeping. Maybe you can't exercise. Uh, it affects your relationships, you your job. I mean, everything can be affected by it. You don't want to live that way. So honestly, if you're dealing with chronic pain or you know someone who is, do some research and find a chronic pain center or treatment center because they are out there and there is help for it. And one of the things, and I treat a fair amount of it also that can help is hypnosis, because a lot of times I get people in who will say they're having seizures, they're having pain, whatever. And the doctors have run every test they can. And they will finally say, this is not a physical problem. It's emotional or mental. And that's when they come to me and I can help with that. So it's, that's something to keep in mind. Then another thing that can cause or exacerbate depression is substance misuse. Nearly 30% of people with substance misuse also have some type of depression. So they start using drugs in order to help them feel better. And maybe it does initially, but ultimately it they just become more depressed. So that is not a good solution. Don't do that. Okay. So let's look at some things that you can do to help you feel better. One of them is face your fears. We all tend to avoid things that we don't like. It is just a common reaction. And a lot of times because we're avoiding doing whatever this thing is, we lose our confidence. We withdraw. We don't connect with people. We don't talk with them. We don't go out. And, and it just makes everything worse. So facing the situations is just almost always going to make them become easier. And y'all, I have a great story for this. When I started this podcast, when God told me to do it, I was like, okay. And I did it. And I thought, especially those first few weeks, maybe a couple of months, I thought all the technical aspects were going to eat my lunch. It was unbelievably complicated, all the stuff that I had to do. And I'm trying to figure it out and, and muddling through it and blah. And I wanted to just chuck the whole thing, but I knew that God had told me to do it. So I kept pushing through. And now this is episode 23. It's so much better. There is still a lot to be done. And when I, the recording is just, one part of it. And there's so many other things that I made a chart on Excel. And so when I finish the uh, recording the podcast, then I have to do all these other, there's like eight other things I have to do in order to get it ready to go. And so to make sure I don't forget, I have it on a chart. And for each one, I just check it off that I've done it. But had I stopped, I would have felt depressed because I would have not been obedient to what God told me to do. So sometimes you just have to suck it up, face your fear, and go. Next, talk about this one a lot. Change the messages you are giving yourself. In your fight against depression, a lot of it is going to be emotional and mental. And so 
most people who are depressed, one of the things that they tend to do, that the thought process, is they're in a situation and they immediately leap to the worst possible conclusion. Uh, it's just going to be this. I'm going to lose my job. I'll be out on the streets. Nobody will ever speak to me again. It'll be horrible. I'll die in the poorhouse. Whatever. That's a very common thing. And that does not help. So when you're feeling really bad about yourself, start using some logic. Okay. You may feel like nobody likes you, but is that really true? Do you have any friends? Do you have family? Do people talk to you? I mean, if small children run away, run away screaming when you come into view, maybe, but most of the time that doesn't happen. Um, you may feel like the most worthless person on the planet, but really, is that true? So start using some logic to counteract those thoughts. And I mentioned last time, therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, they are really good at doing this. So if you feel like a lot of your thoughts are making you more depressed, maybe some therapy with a CBT person can really be helpful. Next, try to do something fun. This can be tough because when you're depressed, nothing feels like fun or nothing sounds like fun. You have to do it anyway. And in fact, you have to probably work at having fun. So plan some things that you used to enjoy, even if they feel like a chore right now. Decorate cakes. Make that quilt. Go on the bike ride. Go out with friends for dinner. Do the things that you used to enjoy and tell yourself I'm doing them now because I know these are fun activities and I'm going to start enjoying them again pretty soon. Just keep telling yourself that and keep doing them. It's much better, I promise, than sitting at home in that dark room staring at the wall. Next is set some goals for yourself. A lot of times when you're depressed, you feel like you're stuck and you're not getting anything done. And a lot of times that's true. So that makes you feel worse. You need to start setting some goals for yourself that you can do. Maybe just some daily goals. Start small. Maybe you need to do the dishes every other day. Maybe you need to get out and check your mail in the mailbox. Whatever it is, set some goals for yourself. And I promise you will feel better when you meet those goals. Don't be ridiculous about it. Don't say that you're going to go out and run 10 miles. That's not going to happen. And then you'll beat yourself up over that. Make them small, bite-sized, easily managed goals so that you can start getting some successes under your belt. And then as you start feeling better, you can add a little bit more challenging goals. Again, don't go crazy on it. Don't self-medicate. Talked about this one before. For some people who are depressed, alcohol, marijuana, whatever can really become a problem. And, you know, short term, yes, they can make you feel less depressed, but it is not a good long, long-term solution. Sorry. It is not a good long-term solution. It really isn't. They're not going to solve your problems, and you're going to end up feeling more depressed after the effects wear off. A big one, if you are depressed, that you need to do, I promise, is start limiting use of social media. Social media is so widely accessible now. We can all get it on our phones, our tablets, our computers, whatever. It is available around the clock. The problem is that you can become a phone that you can become a slave, sorry, to your phone or to your devices. There's all these alerts going on. There's all these things happening and you, you just, you're constantly checking it. And what you have to remember is that these social media platforms, they are designed to get your attention. They want you on there all the time. That's how they make money. So they are they're The whole thing is designed to lure you in and to make you keep coming back. And Social media use can create psychological cravings, just like a gambling compulsion or addiction to nicotine or alcohol. You can become addicted to social media. It absolutely can happen. When you get a like or someone shares a post or comments favorably on it, you get a little uh, release of dopamine in your brain that makes you feel good. It, it's the same kind of reward that you get when you take a bite of chocolate or uh I don't know, win a hand of cards or something. And the more you're rewarded, the more time you want to spend on social media, even if it becomes detrimental to other areas of your life. And it can. I mean, you all probably know people who are just glued to their phone. You can't even get them to make eye contact when you're having a conversation with them, which I find very annoying. 
Social media can promote negative experience, such as feeling inadequate about your life and maybe your appearance and your job and everything because everybody else is doing so great. And look how wonderful they are and how amazing they are. And here I am. You really cannot compare because people are posting their very best things on social media. Some people are Photoshopping their pictures so they look better. No one posts the bad stuff on there. So you you can't compare yourself to what you see on the Facebook pages. Something else that uh, social media excess use promotes is FOMO, fear of missing out. And my son says that our dogs have FOMO, which they do, because anytime you're trying to do something, boy, they are right there. They don't want to miss a second. They want to be right in the middle of it. Um, so the idea that you are missing out, that everybody else is having these wonderful, amazing experiences, and here you are slogging away at your job, It's it really is like an addiction. FOMO can have you checking social media every few minutes to make sure that you didn't miss anything and replying to everything. And it it's just not good. I mean, especially if you're driving or trying to sleep or whatever. I finally figured out a while back how to turn off alerts on my phone because it was beeping all the time and it was driving me nuts. I was like, I don't care that somebody posted on Facebook and I don't need an alert for this. And so I have been much happier with all of that turned off. And you can do that too. Social social media excess use can also promote isolation. It's ironic because we feel like we're connecting to other people. But really, a study out of the University of Pennsylvania found that high usage of Facebook, Snapchat, or Instagram increases rather than decreases feelings of loneliness. The study also found ironically, that reducing social media usage can make you feel less lonely and less isolated, and it can improve your overall well-being. Again, too much social media can increase anxiety and depression. Y'all, we need to meet face-to-face and in-person in order to feel better. This um, connecting online you know, it's okay, especially if there are people who don't live in your area, and this is the only way you can connect with them. That's fine. But we need face-to-face. We need in-the-flesh meetings. They don't take the place of that. So when you just have, like, everything is online and you don't, you're not getting out in person, which COVID did not help, by the way, um, you are really at risk for developing or exacerbating anxiety or depression. Something else that can happen with too much social media usage is cyberbullying. About 10% of teens report being bullied on social media and uh, are subjected to just these offensive comments. And social media platforms are horrible for spreading rumors, lies, abuse that can really hurt people it can ultimately lead people to committing suicide. That has happened. So what are some things that you can do? Oh, some other things. I'm sorry. I'm already on that. Other things that you can do. Sorry, we're not done yet. One is go outside. When you are depressed, you tend to pull back into your cave. And I've, I've, I have uh, family members who were depressed and they would, I'd go to their house All the curtains were drawn. It was dark inside and it drove me crazy. Um, But they will tend to do that. They don't want to go outside. They're inside. They're in their cocoon. Mm, And it's kind of a safety thing, but it does not help. Get outside. Bring nature into your everyday life and it can help you mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So do things like go out and garden. Go for a walk. Take your dog for a walk. Um, Go exercise outside. Go work in your yard. Do all of those things because it can improve your mood. It can reduce feelings of stress, anger, or depression. It can help you feel more relaxed. There is research that shows that that natural light, fresh air, green plants, or being near water, if you're lucky enough to live near a river or a lake or a beach. I'm jealous if you live near a beach. Um, all of those things can really make you feel better. It can improve your physical health. Being outside improves your confidence and self-esteem. 
it also can help you be more active. I mean, when you're outside, you tend to move around more and do things because when you're inside, what are you doing? You're probably sitting on your couch. That's not very active. And if you're active, you're going to feel better anyway. Also, it can help you meet and get to know new people and it can connect you to your local community. If you're out walking your dog in your neighborhood, you're going to see people. At least you may wave to them or say hi. Sometimes you may stop and chat. So again, it gets you connected in real life. It also can reduce loneliness going outside because you'll probably see other people there. Something else that can be helpful is to spend time with animals. I love this one. Pets tend to have evolved, and a lot of times they are really attuned to us and to our behavior and emotions. Dogs pretty much understand a lot of the words that we say. So I am very careful not to say the word walk around my dogs or treat until I'm ready to take them on a walk or give them a treat because then they immediately get excited. And I think, no, no, wait, I meant I was going for a walk. You're not. No. So I I have to be careful with that. They can interpret our tone, tone of voice, our body language and gestures. And a dog will look into your eyes and try to figure out, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? Of course, they're also probably trying to work out, when are you going to take me for a walk or give me a treat? So that happens also. Pets, especially dogs and cats, this is uh, documented. This is researched. I'm not just making this up. They can reduce stress, anxiety, and depression. They can ease loneliness. They can encourage you to exercise and to be playful. They can improve your cardiovascular health. I love that. Pets also provide valuable companionship to older adults, and they can add joy and unconditional love in your life. When I get home, my dogs are right there. They are so happy to see me. Of course, they're also wondering how soon are we going for our walk, but they're happy to see me. Um, And a lot of times in the evening, one of my dogs, Chewy, will just uh, hop up on my lap. And so I'll be watching TV and sitting there petting him and it's, it is, it's the most soothing, calming thing. It just makes me feel happy. So some benefits of pet ownership. Again, all of these are documented, not making them up. Pet owners are less likely to suffer from depression than people without pets. People with pets have lower blood pressure in stressful situations than people who do not have pets. I thought this was interesting. One study found that when people with borderline hypertension or high blood pressure adopted a dog from a shelter, their blood pressure declined significantly within five months. Pretty remarkable. And that's pretty statistically significant too. Playing with a dog, cat, or other pet can elevate levels of serotonin and dopamine. That's, those are those feel-good chemicals in our body, which help us feel happy and calm and relaxed. So it's a good thing. And I, when I play with my dogs, I mean, they're so silly. They just make me laugh. And laughter is therapeutic. It's good. It's a great anti-depression tool. Pet owners tend to have lower triglyceride and cholesterol levels, which are indicators of heart disease, than people without pets. I love this one. Heart attack owners with pets survive, no, heart attack patients, sorry, with pets survive longer than those who do not have pets. I mean, a heart attack, that's pretty remarkable. And then pet owners over 65 make 30% fewer visits to their doctor than those who do not have pets. So pets are a great one, but let me just say, you need to have, I think, especially if you're having dogs, a a backyard for them to play in, and you need to walk them. You can have dogs in an apartment if you walk them regularly. So just that's just my little thing. Another thing that you can do to help fight depression is to try and eat a healthy diet. A lot of times when depression hits, people either eat like not very much at all or they eat way too much. So again, they can gain or lose weight. Um, so try to limit sugary, sweetened foods, any type of soda or energy drinks, fried foods, processed meats, refined grains, breakfast cereals, white bread, and certain high-fat dairy, high dairy products. Try to include in your diet whole grains, beans. Y'all, I'm making a 
a big crock pot full of black bean soup tomorrow. It's one of my favorite things. I love it. And it's good for you. Legumes, vegetables, fruits, nuts, fish, olive oil. All of those things are good for you to eat and they can help you feel better. Again, if you're taking good care of yourself, you are going to feel better. The problem is when you're depressed, you don't feel like doing much of anything, including taking care of yourself. So another thing that can be helpful is to have a routine. When people get depressed, they just, everything gets out of whack. Their sleep is disrupted and maybe because they're staying up late and watching TV. Um, so try to stick to a routine so that you can be as normal as possible. Um, cook, eat regular meals, take a shower every day, get dressed, brush your treat, brush your teeth, see other people, plan some fun, different things to do. Have some type of structure in your life because that does help you feel better. Now I'm going to say another one that is going to sound contradictory, but it really isn't. And that is do something new. If we do too much of the same old, same old, it can get boring and depressing. So you want to have a structure, you want to have a routine, but you also want to periodically interject something new and fun into it. When we challenge ourselves to do something different, there are chemical changes in our brain. Trying something new raises the levels of dopamine, and that's associated with pleasure, enjoyment, and learning. So push yourself to do something different. Go to a museum, pick up a book and go outside and read it on a park bench, volunteer at a soup kitchen, take a language class, help somebody out, try some different things, and you will feel better. Okay. Here are some Bible verses for depression. And again, I want you all to remember, I said this last time, depression is not a sin or a character flaw. It can come from a lot of different causes. We just need to keep trying to get better and keep asking God for his help. So I gave some verses last time. These are some other ones. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Love it. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I find that very reassuring. He is with me wherever I go. Psalm 40, 1 and 2, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Isaiah 41.10, one of my favorites that I say every, well, not every morning, this is, but I say a couple of times a week. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Is that a great promise or what? Psalm 34, 17 through 18. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. I love this part. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. How often have we felt brokenhearted or crushed in spirit? God is right there when that happens. Romans 8, 38 through 39. This is so amazing. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Y'all, when we are depressed, one of the lies that Satan tries to tell us is that God is not there, or if he is there, he does not care about us anymore. That is so untrue. It is a huge lie. God is always there and there is nothing, if we are his, that can separate us from his love. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. God helps us feel better so that we can help other people feel better. I love that that cycle that's in there. Psalm 37, 23, and 24. 
The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Is that great? So, y'all, there are so many good Bible verses on depression. Find some. Write them out or type them out. Put them up on uh, post-it notes or, or index cards around your house, in your office, in your car, so that you see them all the time and that you remember God is with you. He loves you. He wants you to be happy. You're his. So remember that. Okay. Fun fact about Waco. The state flower of Texas is the blue bonnet. And there are a lot of them in Waco right now, kind of everywhere. They're called blue bonnets. I wonder this and looked it up because that was the shape of the petals on the flower. Well, that's what they resemble is the bonnets that were worn by pioneer women to um, protect them from the sun. And you see them in Texas by highways a lot. That started with Lady Bird Johnson. She began handing out Texas Highway Beautification Awards and gave money, her own money, to the winners. So people were planting blue bonnets, Indian paintbrushes, and black-eyed Susans along Texas roads. And in Waco, a lot of times you will see people stopping to take pictures there by the side of the road with all the blue bonnets and the Indian paintbrushes. For years... <laughs> I called them bluebells, and I finally realized what I was doing. That really comes from bluebell ice cream, which is made in Texas, and is also very good ice cream if you have not ever had it. I highly recommend it. Okay. Along with this podcast and with Waco Hypnosis Center, I am available to do public speaking at events. If you are interested, interested in having me for an event, you can contact me either through my website, www dot drmelissarich.com or you can email me at info at drmelissarich.com. If you enjoy this podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would do one or more of the following. Write me an amazing review because, hey, it's an amazing podcast. Share this episode on social media. Follow my podcast. All of those things would be helpful because I'm trying to build up my audience and every little bit of help that I get from you all is really encouraging. So if you would do any of those, that would be great. All right, ladies, that is it for another episode of Taking Care of Your Temple podcast. I hope this was helpful, and I hope that I will see you back next time. Everyone have a good day. Bye.